Thank you so much for joining us on this call to celebrate the alewife. We're super, super excited to share a beautiful video that Kate Yoder put together, and he's on the call today. Has some incredible footage of underwater fish. He had an underwater camera. Um, so get ready for that, which is super exciting. Before I introduce further, um, I just want to let you know that we, um, we have the chat box. If you haven't seen it yet, feel free to put comments and questions in there. Also, if you want to put your name and your grade and the school that you go to, we'd love to see who's gathered here today. So I am going to share my screen briefly before we do our introductions and have our video um, to show you what our Alewife celebration has looked like in the past when we've been able to gather together on the ground. So can you see my screen? Awesome. So this is a photograph. Um, Bailey, one of our panelists, is in this photo, and Chris DeVore from the Crane Book Fist Hatchery. Um, we, we would gather at Pierce's Pond in Penobscot um, for several years in a row now to have a little festival and celebrate the alewife. This is a photograph of a salmon tank with baby salmon. This here is a photograph of smoked fish, and this is generally a snack that we have at the Alewife Festival. So if any of you have yes. been to the, the festival before, feel free to put a note in the chat box um, about what you enjoyed about the festival, or if you have ever smoked a fish or eaten a smoked fish, tell us about it in the chat box. There was also the chance to use a pond net to um, pick up some of the alewives swimming into Pierce's Pond from the stream and to look at them more closely. And even a chance to reach down into the water and pick up a fish yourself. So we're very sad that we can't have this festival at Pierce's Pond this year, but we're super excited to be here instead with all of you, um, at least to be celebrating virtually. And we're gonna be encouraging you to go out to different locations to see the fish yourself after this. So before we share the Alewife video, um, we're just going to do some introductions. My name is Lander and I work for Blue Hill Heritage Trust as the outreach coordinator. Um, and I'm kind of our moderator for today, trying to handle the technology in the background. So I'm going to pass it over to the panelists now to do some introductions themselves. Don't fall flat. I'm Mike Tallhauser. I'm a fisheries biologist with the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. And I help with all the, the monitoring and the, the research and the management um, that the towns are, are working on. Okay, my name is Bailey Bowden. And I'm from the town of Penobscot, and I'm an alewife harvester. You can go play with my angel at the shack. You can go play with my angel at the shack. Brett or Siona, would you like to introduce yourselves? Yeah, I can't see Brett, but um, I'll go next. <laughs> my name is Siona. I'm excited to be here with all of you. And um, I work for a group called Maine Coast Heritage Trust. That's a statewide land trust. And my job is working with people, um, landowners, with government, with different organizations, to make sure that some special pieces of land stay natural for wildlife and for people. And I'm, hi everybody. I am. Um, so I'm not coming up here, but hey guys, I can see you. Okay, hey everybody. Um, I'm Brett. I work with the Downey Salmon Federation. Um, so I, it's we're a group that um, helps helps fish and helps um, people connect to fish. And we're based mostly in Washington County, but we do lots of work over in, in Hancock County. And we started working with Bailey. Uh, and Mike and Lander and Siona on, on different projects and um, yeah, here to um, answer any questions you guys have about fish that that um, and how they relate to the rest of this our landscape. So. 
Awesome. Thank you everyone for introducing yourselves. You'll get to see these panelists who just introduced themselves in our video, which is coming up next. I'm just going to ask everyone to mute themselves if you can, and otherwise I might hit the mute all button. Um, and that way we'll be able to hear the video. So, uh, I have a question. Okay, what's your question? I have no clue what's going on. I joined late and I have no clue what's going on. Okay, cool. I'll quickly fill you in. So um, the panelists for the Alewife celebration virtually today just introduced themselves. Um, and we're about to start a, a video and it, it's going to show footage um, that Tate Yoder collected over the last couple of weeks um, of the work being done to restore the fish ladders um, on the peninsula. And then there will be a question and an answer at the end of this presentation. Okay. I went to see the Alewives a few days ago and I could touch them, but fish feel weird on my hands and I don't like it. So whenever I touch one, um, I put my hand back because it feels so slimy. <laughs> I don't like the it. Other day, the other day, my friend's dad caught a giant fish. I can't remember what it's called, but it was giant. It was like about as big as my sister laying down. And it was super slimy. <laughs> Wow, these are all really cool comments. Um, once I start the video, I'm going to put mute on everybody, but please feel free to keep putting these comments in our chat box because we would love to hear from you. I am now going to share the video. I'm just going to share my screen again and pull up our video. Okay, here we go. My name is Bailey Bowden and I'm a seventh generation resident of the town of Penobscot. I've always had an interest in sea run fisheries and I've always enjoyed fishing. So smelts and alewives have always been a, a popular pastime for me in the spring. You know, some of my, my fondest early memories are, you know, alewives come when spring comes and the water first turns warm. So you're not afraid to bail into the brook and get wet. It doesn't matter if you get soaked. It's a nice, warm, sunny day, and you know, you're know you playing with the fish. Bailey talked to me about um, the importance of alewife and the fact that these fish that he grew up playing with and watching the run of and eating and seeing as bait for fishermen, these fish couldn't get up to survive in this system anymore. An alewife is a species of river herring. If you've ever seen a herring before, they're about 10, 12 inches long, a silvery little fish. And the cool thing about alewives is they don't just spend all their time in one spot. Uh, right now, we're watching alewives and counting alewives coming back up a stream and we're counting them into a pond. They're coming back because they spent most of their lives in the Atlantic Ocean, swimming up and down the, the coast from the Carolinas to Canada. And the part that they're doing in their life right now is they're swimming back to the ponds that they were born in to make new babies, to start the life cycle again. And after that, those fish coming out of the eggs that are left right now are gonna do that same huge journey back to the ocean. After about three years when they're mature, they'll come back into the pond and make the same swim that their parents swam before and they can do that till they're about eight years old. This life cycle that we call it um, is something where we call the the fish anadromous. Other species like salmon, like brook trout, like elvers make this same type of run back and forth between saltwater and freshwater and that's one of the things that makes them really special and part of our communities. 
What's an alewife? This is an alewife. One piece of the alewife life cycle that's really fragile, I guess I would say, is the fact that they have to swim up these small streams to get from the ocean where they can go anywhere they want. Yeah, they have to watch out for sharks and halibut and cod and everything else, but they're free to move around out there, but they're real at risk when they're coming through these small streams. They've got to get into the pond and it's pretty easy to dam up some of these small streams. And so the projects that the stream behind me that, that you can probably see is an example where they, they uh, humans put in a dam and stopped fish passage and it took community members scooping fish over that and that was the only way fish used to get in this pond before um, the fishway was restored. Myself and other individuals in town spent many hours dipping alewives over a concrete dam just so they would be able to reproduce and, and come back out. You know, 200 years ago, before all these dams were here, every stream that left a pond in Maine had alewives in it. But there can be other um, issues like beavers that can also dam up rivers. And so a lot of the volunteer work that happens is going to these beaver dams when the fish are trying to either, the adults are coming upstream or the juveniles are leaving, um, or the adults leaving, which they'll be doing in a couple weeks after they spawn, and cutting little notches into those beaver dams so fish can pass either way. And we have to do it about <clears throat> two or three times a week. Alewife streams are just kind of naturally set up for good places for a beaver dam. The Bagaloose River is such a rich ecosystem. So a river right here in Brooksville, um, Castine, Penobscot, Sedgwick. There's so much wildlife in the land and water here and helping to keep that alive and keep it thriving has been a goal for a lot of years. It made a lot of sense for me to team up with Bailey to try and figure out how my work with landowners and on conservation work in the area could help be teamed up with his and others to make it possible for fish, for these fish and others, to be able to swim from the ocean all the way up to their home ponds and back throughout the whole Bagaduce River watershed. So a watershed is all that land and the streams and the ponds that all feed a river. And the Bagaduce River is sort of the center of this. And there were ponds and streams that were blocked so that fish couldn't go up into those anymore and spawn. Most, most fisheries are managed by a state or a federal government and they do that on a really big scale where you say, this is how many of these kind of fish we have in the Atlantic Ocean, and this is how many thing we can, think we can take out of it. And that works for some species, but for um, fisheries like alewife that have one special place they come back to every year, um, that local scale, that local piece is really important. And that's where community members have to come in because the state um, government only has a handful, probably five people, that can get out to these places, um, each, you know, where all these fish are running. And without people from these towns helping to count fish, take samples from fish, and um, use their understanding of their fishery that they've known since they were kids, without those people being part of it, things wouldn't get done on this uh, scale that it's happening right now. My name's Sarah O'Malley and I live here in Sedgwick and I grew up in the area so I've been here my whole life and I got involved in the counting a few years ago I saw a poster at Tradewinds uh, looking for volunteers to help count and I said I want to do that because I want to see these fish I've heard about uh, fish runs and alewives and I knew they were in the Bagaduce I grew up on the Bagaduce but I'd never seen them and I always I just wanted to see it so Mike uh, met me here. It took about 30 seconds to uh, train me to count, which is actually not that hard, and I've been doing it ever since. Getting this thing that links the ocean to the fresh water and then back again um, in this zone of, of the Bagaduce River and this little estuary that is, you know, so dynamic and so, this is so exciting. This is such an exciting part of it and it's a, an amazing linkage between these two kind of different worlds and th these fish bring them together um, and I just, I can't get over that. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's so beautiful. I like to joke that they have food tattooed on the side of them because that's what they are. They're food to everything. Uh, the Passamaquoddy refer to them as the fish that feeds all. 
And it's really true from juvenile to adult, everything eats these things from insects to whales. It's really amazing. These are truly a, a forage species for, for everything. Some of the main ways people um, consume alewives are smoking them. They're really good smoked. Um, people pickle them, they can them, um, so they'll preserve them for later. And uh, they're bony, bony fish, but if you can get past the bones, they're delicious. So, so far we've done two projects out of five. We were able to take out a dam in one place and install what's called a fish way. Uh, and in the other place we did a, a number of different changes, but mainly had to deal with an old dam that was falling apart in disrepair really, uh, and make it so that the water level of the pond stays the way it is, but the fish can go up and down. We're trying to restore all the native fisheries, the LY fisheries in the Bagaduce River. So that's increasing the run at Walker's Pond, which is a, a pretty decent run now, but helping that out. And then we're currently um, stocking Frost Pond and Parker Pond, and we hope to have fishways put into both of those in the near future. One really cool thing about, about these projects that are happening on the Bagaduce River is that the, the towns that were involved, that are so involved, said if we're going to have fish in our Bagaduce ponds come back, we want them to come from other Bagaduce ponds. And so we, instead of coming from some place in Augusta um, where the state usually gets their fish, we use local volunteers, people from the communities to collect fish from Walker Pond to put those into Parker Pond and Frost Ponds. So right now behind me what's going on is we're taking alewives from Walker Pond that are coming in to spawn and we're pulling them out of the stream. You can see he's got a net right there of fish and we're bringing these fish into Parker Pond and um, Frost Pond and we're stocking those ahead of some of the fishway projects that we have going on. We're taking about 600 fish for Parker Pond and about 700 fish for Frost Pond and the babies from those, um, the eggs that hatch out of those adults will then keep coming back to those ponds and it'll start that life cycle all over again in each of those different ponds. So once we get those two uh, ponds stocked with fish and fish start returning to those, we'll have uh, the whole bag of deuce uh, run open up to, to fish again. A lot of members of the, the Bag of Deuce Alewife Committee are here, townspeople from Brooksville and Sedgwick that donate 500 hours a year, every year of their time uh, to this effort. And so. They're working to, to have, let their run um, fill other runs and um, open up passage to the Bagadoos. It shows that there are so many other parts of the whole. We each have roles and we're each important to getting these done because these projects are so complicated. It's not just a bit of construction on the ground but you have to find the money for that and you have to get the landowners okay with that and you have to then keep volunteers counting the fish to prove to the grants that their money achieved what they wanted to do. So there's so much that goes into these projects that they're only doable with a whole lot of people each playing their role and coming together to make it possible. It's amazing how many of these values overlap among different organizations. So this has brought together a broad range of, of group with different um, thoughts and ideas to form a collaborative so we've, we can all work together and make these projects happen. People ask why folks are doing this, why the volunteers are doing this, and I always say you know when, when you're a fishing town and you have every year around the, almost the exact same day you've got hundreds of thousands of fish swimming from the ocean into your town and it's bait and it's food and it's food for everything around, you're gonna be pretty connected to it and you're gonna do what it takes to keep that around. And so that's what I think a lot of this is about. All right, so that was the video portion of our presentation. I noticed in the chat box that it lagged a little bit for some people. I hope that you were able to hear most of it um, and, and see most of it. It's a beautiful video. 
We're now going to move on to some um, a question and answer session with our panelists. And I just want to thank um, those of you who sent in questions um, to ask our panelists today. We have been able to put some of them up on our slideshow, which I'm going to share in just a moment. Um, and some of them were kind of incorporated into, into the video, um, and they may have been answered that way as well. OK, so I'm going to share my screen now once again. And bring up our slideshow. Okay, question and answer time. The first question that we have, and if you recognize this as a question that you sent in, um, please feel free to identify yourself in the chat box. We're not sure who, which student came up with this question, but it's a wonderful one. Um, so I'm gonna read it, and then um, panelists, I guess you can um, decide amongst yourselves who would like to answer it, or a couple of you can answer it as well. Question number one, how is the alewife important to Maine fishermen and the economy? I can take a quick stab at it. <clears throat> I think one, there's two pieces to that. One is the, the past and what it has been and then what it could be in the future. And if you look back at um, the past of what the fishery used to be, it used to be in the millions of pounds that were harvested. And so that's, that's pounds of food that could be either food for people or bait or um, other resources and that could be sold by the harvester and so it can be a significant uh, income um, in the state of Maine. And I think um, another piece of it is that even though you know you might think about just the alewife and whether you catch it and sell it or whatever it is, like Bailey mentioned in the video, these fish are food for everything they can fit them into their mouths from the time they're this tiny just out of their eggs to the time they're you know 10 inches long and so they're feeding one of the kids that talked about a fish as big as her I'm guessing that was a halibut and the I went out and fished this year and caught a halibut and guess what we found in its stomach we found an alewife tail and so alewives feed all the fish out in the ocean so whether you're a lobster fisherman that could be using these as bait to bring in lobster, or you're a halibut fisherman, or in the long ago past around here, another ground fish fisherman fishing for cod or other things like that, these fish feed other fish that can be really important pieces of the economy. And with these restoration efforts, we're bringing back fish in all these different places. We're hoping that that's going to improve a lot of those, those fisheries. There's going to be more halibut out there in 10 years and 20 years because they're eating more alewives and river herring and are healthier. Um, and so they have and are and hopefully even more so will be a, a big part of uh, Maine and the economy. Um, Bailey might talk quickly about how what it means to a local town that's able to harvest. Sure, um, <clears throat> a commercial harvest Usually a small percentage of the money goes to the town if it's a private contract or some towns control the harvest all on their own using town employees and it really can make a huge difference in the, the tax, uh, the amount of tax your parents have to pay on their houses and that really helps the town out a lot in, in certain areas in Maine. Hmm. And then Mike, when you, what Mike said too about the future is really important because I think it's also something to put in perspective. Like we, no one alive and, and people's grandparents probably didn't know, don't know a world that's going to have as many alewives as you guys are about to have in the Bagadoos. Um, so it's really hard to imagine what's going to happen, what kind of ideas you'll come up with to how to, you know, how they'll impact your lives. So um, that's something to think about too. Like, there are things that we use these fish for now and we have in the past, but the future, you know, is, is just a, we're going to have more fish now than there's been since before um, we built these dams 200 years ago. So. Wonderful. Thank you for answering that question. Those are all really great answers. So moving on to question two, is an alewife run like a mackerel run? Bailey, you want to do that one or you want? So 
I can jump in an alewife run um, isn't like a, a macro run like a lot of the macro that you see especially in Maine we'll see them coming into our base to, to do a lot of feeding when the water warms up and so that might be what you're thinking of as a, as a macro run when they come in really thick in the bays and um, in places like that where you can catch them off docks and things like that these fish are swimming up um, as part of the reproductive cycle and so they're coming into our ponds where it's safer than being out in the open ocean and the water is warmer and the conditions are right for them to lay eggs in our ponds um, before going back to the ocean where there's more food and then growing big after about three years and then uh, coming back uh, year after year up until about age eight. And so it's a little bit different in that these are coming back to spawn and that they're moving from salt water to fresh water, um, um, which is a really cool thing because basically the alewife's body has to completely change from keeping fresh water in to being able to get rid of fresh water when it comes into to the fresh water system and so their body has to kind of switch up how it does a lot of its uh, regulation. So. Awesome, thank you. Question three, do alewives benefit tourism? Siona, did you want to take this one? Yeah, sure, I can start. Others can add, um, thanks. They do, you wouldn't think so maybe as a small fish, but there are a couple of ways to think about in terms of tourism. There's something called the Down East Cherise Trail that is a map and now a website where you can go and find all the places where alewife run up and down the, at least this part of the coast in Maine. Um, and people are doing that. Um, we're finding people showing up just because they found the place on the map and wanted to go see where alewife are running. Um, and I'm sure that they then need to get lunch or get a drink or whatever while they're there. So tourism as an economy gets some benefit that way. And some of you might know about Damerscotta Mills where there is a big alewife run and they have a real sort of event around the run each year and bring in so many people from around, not just Maine, but outside and New England to come see these alewife run there. And it's a real tourism event. So it can have a real impact. It depends on what the town and the community do around it, but it already has a lot of impact locally in terms of bringing people around to see this happen. It's new and exciting. Does anyone else have anything to add to this question on our panelist team? Okay, I guess we're gonna, we're gonna move on to question four. Oh, and it looks like our photo disappeared, but the question is still there. What is their average size and weight? <laughs> Come on, Bailey and Brett. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the, they're all, they're trying to picture a way that we can, we can represent this. You know, they're, they're about a foot long, right? I'd say if the adults, um, sometimes a little bigger, sometimes a little smaller and they're pretty skinny foot long. So they're not that heavy. You know, they don't weigh that much. Um, you know, if you were to hold them in your hands, you have to squeeze your hands around them. Um, I don't know. Do you guys keep stats over there on your fish's weight, average weight and everything? I think at least Walker Pond, they're around like 150 grams, something like that. So you need to have about nine of them to make a kilogram. And, and actually there are two types. So mostly we, we say alewife, but there are actually two types of fish that are river herring. There's alewives and blueback herring. And they're, they're different sizes a little bit. Alewives are sort of like the bigger, uh, bulkier cousins to blueback herring. So you might see some variety because you actually have two different species of fish that are migrating together. Awesome. Thank you. So we have a few more questions and I am aware that we're at 1030. If, if it's okay with everyone, we'll, we'll just maybe hang on for another four or five minutes um, and then we'll conclude. So question number five, if the lobstermen depend on alewife, do you think that this type of bait will get more lobsters than the traditional bait the lobstermen use? Why do they prefer alewife? I guess 
with any kind of bait, it's all up to the lob. It's, it's, there's a lot of differentiation between one lobster into another um, or one halibut fisherman to another on what's going to catch the most fish. And there's probably a lot of kids with a lot of um, parents that, that lobster fish, and they probably all have an idea of exactly the best thing that fishes for their trap and the way they do it. Um, one of the big things is that this is when a lot of people are starting to set out more and more gear in most years, and Alewife just happened to be coming into our towns by the hundreds of thousands right now. And so it's been kind of a tradition that, you know, you're getting this super fresh bait. It's not the salted herring or uh, mackerel or frozen fish that you might be getting other times of the year. So you're getting super fresh fish right now, which keeps them together better. Um, they've probably got a little bit more of the oil that they have in them. And so that um, it makes sense that they might be a, a little more appetizing to a lobster or a halibut or some other kind of fish um, at this time of year. You're muted. Muted, Lander. <laughs> so sorry about that. <laughs> okay, question number six. What are the plans for the Alewife Run Improvement Project at the Walker Pond Overflow? When will work begin? Yeah, I'll start with that one. Um, so this is the mill pond at the base of Walker Pond, where the mill used to sit on Coastal Road. Um, we hope that construction will happen late summer this year. Um, and it's, it's complicated to explain all that's happening, but what we're doing is trying to work on some improvement to how the fish can run without changing the stream that has been there for decades, a long time, and it works pretty darn well. Hi. We're also gonna do some safety improvements on the dam and then try and make it a bit more of a public place, maybe put in some picnic tables and a little trail there. So you'll see that happening probably this late summer or fall. And for anyone who's been paying attention, there's probably a lot out walk somebody up like along the question of tourism. I've seen more people out checking out the run at Walker Pond this year than ever before. Kids, um, parents, grandparents. It's been great seeing everyone out there. And as an update, um, yesterday was the biggest fish passage day we had the whole year ever when we were counting at Walkers, where we estimated about 40,000 fish went through the fishway in just one day, just yesterday. And the total right now is just under 400,000 fish. So it's pretty, it's been a pretty incredible run this year. Uh, and it's been great to see all you kids out there. Um, just like me reaching in and getting to grab a fish and then letting it back into the, the stream. And so um, it's been really cool seeing everybody out there. Absolutely. I think we just have one more question. That's the, oh, well, we, we have two, but we can see how we're doing on time. Question number seven, have you determined whether or not the Walker Pond pygmy alewives are in fact a separate species or is their smaller size due to a lower level of nutrition in their diet? Wow, somebody's got a solid question. So this is a question Bailey and uh, folks in Brooksville and Sedgwick all had because if you, do, you probably know, this is one of the runs that um, is closed partly because, or mostly because of that size difference. And so, um, so this is something that Bailey and I are working hard to answer on. I'll let him comment on it. But basically, we've looked at the genetics of those. We worked at the university to the professor from California that says that it's not a different species. They're, if you take an alewife at a walker pond or anywhere else in Maine, a, a, genet a scientist looking at its genes couldn't tell any difference. So it's not a different species. Um, it's possible that it has something to do with nutrition in their diet. We took some zooplankton samples, which is the little tiny bugs they eat, um, and those still need to be analyzed. Or it could be um, something just as simple as if you've ever been out there, there's, there's small places where the fish have to shoot through one actually con little concrete tube they've got to get through that's been there for decades and decades, like Siona said. And it's possible that the fish, smaller fish get through some of those things like that a little bit better than bigger fish. So they may have changed over time just to be smaller fish because it's easier to get up that fish way and some of the other obstacles if you're a smaller fish. It's a good question. Bailey, 
you have anything to add on that one? Um, yeah, I, I personally don't believe that there's any difference. I think it's that there is a size difference, but I think it's based on what they're eating. Um, there were other runs in that part of the river at Frost and Parker Pond that had larger LY, and those ponds became blocked to passage by beaver dams. And some of those bigger fish have strayed into Walker's Pond. So they're not all the small fish that used to be there. So I think that kind of pokes a hole in the, the idea that these fish are small because of there's only a small opening that they can get through because now there are some bigger fish in there. Um, it's an interesting question, but I, I'm going to go with it's what they're eating is why they're smaller. We're also going to have some kind of answers to this question because since we took fish from Walker Pond and we're stocking those into Frost and Parker's, um, just the only thing we know now is the juveniles that left there that had a whole bunch of food because there weren't that many in there were about four times bigger than the juveniles we see leaving other ponds. And who knows what that'll translate into, but when we take these fishways, put these fishways in at Parker and Frost Pond, and we see if the fish are coming back as kind of normal sized alewise, we'll know it's there's something definitely specifically, you know, to the Walker Pond that did it and it's not some other outside factor. So it's a question that we're we're digging into more and more every year. And a great question. Awesome. So I think this is our Last question, and then if somebody on the panel wants to talk a little bit about um, what participants can go out and do to, to help with this work. Um, does anyone have a quick answer for question number eight? I know it's a big question. I, I, can, I can take it real quick, Landa, if you want. Thank you, Brett. Um, impacts, when one thing, these fish come up at really distinct times of the year. So like Mike said, there are certain days that you, you know that on this day next year, there will be alewives. So, you know, as, as our climate changes, we may see these fish trying to, to deal with the changes in water temperature and, and flow. Like, is there enough rainwater for them to get out um, when they're babies? So those are all things we need to watch. Um, but one, one thing to also keep in mind is, you know, these fish can actually help um, impact climate change. So this is the other side of the coin, you know, the more fish we let live in our rivers and in our lakes, you know, fish are like people, they're made of carbon. We're all made out of 20% like of our bodies or so is carbon. Um, and carbon in living things keeps it from being in the atmosphere and can help buffer some of the impacts of climate change too. So, you know, yeah, there'll be impacts on these fish as they try to adapt to what's going on. And by, by us giving them access to their homes and letting there be more and more of them, um, they'll be able to deal with some of those changes a little better, hopefully, and they also might help um, help stop some of the you know the the speed of some some of the impacts of climate change. So, thank you, Brett. Okay, so lastly, what can you do to help be a part of this? I think we could all kind of quickly go around and finish this one off I think right now you know at the age that most kids are watching this I think a lot of them are doing this get out there and and see what's happening and start making your own observations and understanding what what happens in the run a lot of the fishway work that we're doing right now is coming from input from people that have watched these fishways for you know their whole life and understanding what it used to look like and so you guys are starting that um, that journey to be able to help support this fishery, these fisheries uh, in your community. So get out there and, and watch fish and play with fish and, and connect with them. And I'll add an idea. I also want to thank everyone for these terrific questions because these are great. Good job coming up with tough questions. Um, another idea is we need to learn about the people and the community uses of alewife in the past. So ask your grandparents or your parents whether they canned alewife, did they eat alewife, did they smoke it, where did they get it from. Get those stories because that's one of the things we're really missing and you can help us all find so we know where the alewife ran and what people used to do with them. 
Yeah, and and be like Bailey. You know, like go catch these fish, fall in the river, get wet, and just you know get to know them, and then you know you can be there the next the next time these fish need help, you'll be just like Bailey, ready to go and help them out. So. Well, I think one thing you can do is join a great group like Blue Hill Heritage Trust or Main Coast Heritage Trust that always have some sort of community programming around fish or fisheries and restoration. And that's a great place to start. Wonderful. That's super exciting. I hope that you can all get out to play with fish um, in the next couple of weeks before they head back out to the ocean. And I think this is where we'll wrap up. Thank you all for staying on with us for about 15 minutes longer than we had said. There will be a recording of this event, um, which I will probably send out to all of your teachers as an email link, and then it can also be available on our, on our different organizations' websites. So just thank you all so much for joining us. Um, we, we feel very grateful that you chose to spend your morning um, celebrating Alewives with us. And do we have any last comments from the panelists before we close this meeting? I just think we might have to do next year's um, beavers because there has been a lot of lively <laughs> chat on there. And it is really, uh, I always, this is, this is my, one of my alewife jokes is I hold a lot of meetings with town folks and um, I always put the topic beaver on the agenda and I always put it last because as soon as you start talking about beavers, it takes up the whole conversation. And so, um, Maybe we can schedule something early next year to talk about the, the benefits and challenges that beavers represent. And throwing out some um, interesting observations. So that's what I'm out there. Thank you, Mike, for uh, addressing that. That definitely has been a huge side conversation that's been happening. Um, yes. Anything else? All right. I think we'll. Thanks we'll for being on. Yeah. Thanks, guys. <laughs> all right. Well, I, we hope you all have a really good rest of your day. And um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks for having us. Thank you.